You know, some of the best quarters of footy ever played are found buried deep here in the archives of the AFL. <coughs> and the best of what's in here is now on video. It's fabulous footy flashbacks. Three unbeatable quarters of footy action. And most of this stuff hasn't been seen since it was played. These are the quarters that shaped your club. Now you can relive them over and over again. Fabulous Footy Flashback Series 2. Five new videos, three fabulous quarters on each. Of course, this is the stuff that made the legend. There is about the game of football something that touches every beating heart. And there is something for every Australian man, woman and child in this living video history. A hundred years of Australian football on video. It's yours to keep forever at these stores now. We now ask Charlie Sutton to present the Premiership Cup, and there it is. The West Coast Eagles, Premiers 1992. G'day, I'm John Warshog. I played 209 games for the West Coast Eagles over 12 seasons and I loved every minute of it. Since my retirement at the end of 1998, people have asked me so many times what have been the highlights of your footy career. There's been so many and so varied over the years it's hard to pinpoint any, but I really always fall back on the 1992 and 1994 premierships. They were certainly the major highlights. Also, all the friendships I've made with my teammates and people around football over those years has certainly been a big part of my life. That first grand final win was absolutely fantastic. The whole day was a very, very special day. It started with our normal warm up early in the morning about nine o'clock where we left the hotel to go for a jog around the park and get ourselves warmed up and ready to go. From there we went back to the hotel, had, had a light breakfast, and then we started with our motivational stuff. Mick first showed us a video of inspirational highlights throughout the whole season. Highs and lows that just showed the emotion, the hard work that we'd all put in over 22 home and away games and some of the finals leading up to our grand final appearance. He also read out a letter that was written by Adrian Barrett and Phil Scott, an unbelievably emotional letter. Those two guys had put in a, as much work as we had throughout the whole year and wanted desperately to be part of that premiership. But they couldn't, they weren't selected in the final side and they'd penned a letter to us that just wished those players that were selected all the best saying that they were the guys that now had the chance to be part of history and make history for the West Coast Eagles. And that really pumped the guys up. After reading that letter, we were so emotional, we were ready to go there and then. But we had to bide our time back up to our rooms to get ourselves ready to then head across to the ground and play in our second grand final. We did that and instead of catching a bus across to the MCG, we were only staying about a kilometre away, we actually walked as a very tight group through the thousands of Geelong supporters that were streaming into the MCG. And they really gave it to us. They hurled plenty of abuse at us. But that just drew us, drew us even closer together. The players really felt bonded. And by the time we got into our change rooms, all the fanfare was over. It was business as normal, even though it was gonna be the biggest day of our lives. And once we were in the change rooms, we just started preparing. There was no emotional stuff. It was just down to business, Let's get ready for the big day. And already some pushing and shoving with McIntosh and Brownless. Brownless a confidence player. Throwing him towards goal. And like Matera, he pulls it badly in towards the pocket and it is taken over the line by Worsfold for throwing. He belongs a left forward pocket. And Eagle is down. Adler collected him, that's Pike. See this again. Just copying one on the chin there, Pike. Free kick at centre wingers, Gary Ablett and Carl Langdon. Yes, Langdon ran right Blizzard down from half forward to try and remonstrate with Ablett, but he should just concentrate on the footy. Players stop momentarily. Couch a clever tap to Hocking. Hocking from 20 metres goes bang and misses. So unnecessary too by Peter Wilson. Nothing gained whatsoever. And then the same thing from Stoneham. 
Barnes wins it, but straight to the run of Matera from 55. He sets sail for home with a mighty kick. What a goal. At quarter time, Geelong leads. And at the bottom, Evans over the top. Matera somehow gets out of jail. Peter Matera, 52 metres. Pulls it back. What a magnificent kick for goal. He centres the ball, a magnificent kick. Runs though, missed it. I think it was intended for Brownless. McIntosh over the top. Petty out of defence towards midfield. Awkward bounce for Lewis. Turley waits behind, keeps it in front, lays it off. White taken now by Evans, who changed his mind in midair. Changes his mind again from 45 metres out. It's another goal. The flow is Langdon. He pulls it back. Hinkley. Down they go, he and Turley, picked up by Sumich. Sumich's snap is a good-looking one. It's bending around the post. I think it may be a goal. It is. Brennan finds it on the ground. Was he carried forward? No. Wilson, like a cork in the ocean, over his head. It's, oh, my word. From the middle, Simpson crashes to the ground. Kemp goes storming through. Across to Hetty, a delicate little chip to the run of Matera. Suddenly the Eagles are alight. Matera sets sail for home, and the Eagles hit the front. Worked under the ball by McGrath. Quick hands from Brennan, too oh. quick, but it comes back to Matera. Matera on the 50, he could kick this. Matera, it's going to be a goal. But the Eagles are set up for their first flag. At three-quarter time, they lead 11-15, 81. He can go over the top. How's this for a goal? Peter Matera, there's another one. Catch a snap. What a kick this is. History in the making. Sumich, 25 metres out, kicks it. So Wilson for his second. Directly in front. They've got the flag. Peter Sumich has booted five. He's, he's taken his season tally up to 81. And with that one behind kick before, 81-46. There's no need to say that he does prefer that this area. <laughs> and it works they've got it the Eagles have got it Dean Kemp having his 20th kick but only as far as Simpson Simpson back to centre wing Pike and Worsfold again combined into the middle it's a game of possession now with only seconds remaining Evans may have the last kick in this grand final the Eagles are going to win their first play. Were terrific, weren't they, after half time? Outstanding all year, you know. We had our ups and downs, but today, you know, you know what it's like. It's what you played footy for, and we've done it. Got a bit of a mouse there? Yeah. Well, it means nothing, means nothing. Well done, Johnny. Standing ovation for Michael Malthouse. He's lifted this side to the ultimate. I turned straight away and acknowledged my teammates because they were the ones that were there with me and earned that cup. The first interstate side to take the cup away from Victoria. An unbelievably proud moment for us all. 
And it was from that point on that it started to dawn how much it was going to mean to everyone else. Up until that stage, it was just the guys that it really meant so much to. We'd won a premiership. But now we started to realise that there were thousands of people around the country supporting the West Coast Eagles that were really going to feel the win with us. Perth looked like a ghost town, an empty city, at the Royal Show in shops all quiet on the Western Front, unless you happened to be in front of a television, and most made sure they were. <coughs> at Eagles headquarters, families left behind agreed with one commentator, Geelong had two chances, Buckley's and none. It's very, very important, and we've got to bring the cup home. Eagles have got to it. <coughs> Silence, murmurs and then cheers reflected the Eagles' fortunes in front of television sets across the state. Some realised the awesome magnitude of the moment. It was the end of football as we, and especially Victorians, know it. It's the death of the VFL we're watching here. The AFL will be reborn when the Cup comes to Western Australia. I'm going to be drunk about this time next week, so I might get and catch you then. <laughs> Arguably, WA's biggest Eagles fan couldn't help himself. Captain John Worsfold had a firm grip on the AFL Cup the moment the plane crossed the WA border. Football history at 35,000 feet. The joy was overwhelming when the Eagles had landed, for a welcome befitting a state flushed with pride. Morris, get out. Come on, mate. Yeah, look at that, mate. <laughs> the Vic Slayers were ecstatic to be back, including a grand final battered Chris Mainwaring, who had to be wheeled from the plane. This one for the boys, eh? I'll be happy with that. I played football all my life and a lot of hard work and a lot of hours of training. A lot of injuries that you've copped and uh, this is just a reward for all of that. Hundreds line the roadside from the airport. More were waiting for a victory party at Subiaco Oval. Thousands packed into Subiaco Oval for the greatest homecoming the Eagles have ever known. And the city is alive. And that means a lot Thank to Western you. Australia. And what did the Eagles do yesterday? Um, they played for the end, they won. The Premier's Cup brought home to Western Australia for the very first time. Then from the all-conquering heroes, an on-ground performance like never before. Everywhere we go! Ninety-four was obviously another sensational year winning the Premiership again. People have asked to differentiate which is better, 1992 or 1994. You just can't do it. The only difference really was that 1992 was the first one for the West Coast Eagles. But they were both sensational and just the ultimate reward for all the hard work that you put in over a long period of time. So we went into 1994 with no particular game plan. We were going to try a couple of new moves on our kickouts from full back which worked pretty well for us. But again, the celebration, the feeling of winning a premiership, the second for a lot of us, but the first for a few players, was just magnificent. <music> Losing the 1991 grand final was the worst feeling I had during my AFL career. Watching the Hawks players go up and get presented with their premiership medallions was an absolutely gut-wrenching feeling. But I felt as though they had earned it. They were the best side on the day. So I went over and did shake the hands of a few of the Hawthorne players and coach just to show my respect for what they'd done during the day. But sitting back watching that, the players certainly felt the pain. This was a moment to give every West Australian a stomach full of butterflies. 
None more so than the 20 Eagles at Waverley. And for the opening eight minutes, it showed as they wasted first use of a two to three goal breeze. Eventually, Peter Sumich marked and Chris Langford made certain of the game's first score, giving away a foolish 50 metre penalty. From the square, familiar sight, drop punt straight through. The Eagles weren't the only ones suffering grand final nerves. The Hawks showed they were mortal after all. Of course, to err is human, but to give away 50 metres in front of goal is unforgivable. Langford again the guilty party. He's 100 metres in debit and two goals. With two unanswered goals on the board, the Eagles gained momentum, although they had to pay for every possession. At the 14-minute mark, Peter Wilson put them 18 points in front with one of the goals of the year. Kicks the ball to goals with bouncing, bouncing. Oh, no! The Hawks finally got on the board two minutes later thanks to a running Paul Deere. Open goal that sits for him and he kicks it. Any nervousness that remained was then replaced by aggression. So we've got uh, fights going left, right and centre here in the centre square. Sumich put the Eagles 20 points ahead with a monster kick at the 28 minute mark and Hawthorne looked to be in trouble. Enter Jason Dunstall. In the last 30 seconds of the quarter he goaled twice and all of a sudden the Hawks were very much alive. That momentum continued immediately after the break. Deer again the destroyer. Plays on, 45 metres out from goal. This could be a lift up. It's a goal. The Eagles were unlucky when Brett Hetty was tripped up within scoring range, but not rewarded by the umpires. The Hawks, however, were making their own breaks. Clever leader Hall, he should kick a goal, and he has put it through. All of a sudden, it was the Eagles 20 points down and looking sick, but in a virtual rewrite of the first quarter, they fought back. A great mark by Chris Mainwaring setting up Sumich's fourth and Chris Lewis finally shrugging off James Morrissey for his first to reduce the half-time margin to 10 points. Occasionally a temperament problem, drop punch, he's kicked that all right. Straight through the middle. The Eagles had to take advantage of the breeze in the third quarter but it was Hawthorne through Morrissey first on the board. Brett Hetty replied from almost the same position as Wilson's miraculous first quarter snap to keep the Eagles in touch. Gee, is that a goal? I think it might be. It is. The Eagles couldn't afford a goal-for-goal goal shootout, but that's exactly what Hawthorne were dictating as they matched every attack to maintain their half-time buffer. Even some Chris Lewis magic couldn't break the spell, and after a 10-goal quarter, the Hawks were still 10 points ahead. The Premiership was won inside the first five minutes of the final term as the Hawks stepped up a gear and opened the floodgates. A near deserted Perth airport welcomed the Eagles back to friendly territory today, but that's how the club planned it, to avoid the chaos of the last few weeks. But it was a vastly different story at Subiaco Oval, where more than 4,000 fans turned up for a chance to say well done. Number three, Chris Mainwaring. We're here to support them today and try and, you know, get to say hello. And we want to thank them for a wonderful year they gave us. Next year I reckon we'll come back and kick the hell out of them. They played well and they were there more than any other team with so I think they were great. Five years to get into a grand final was a fantastic effort. It was pretty disappointing over there so it was good to get home and it's great to have the support. It's just a pity that uh, couldn't have made it a little bit more enjoyable for everyone. You know, losing sides are notorious for not having supporters turn up and uh, I think, you know, it's good for football and uh, good for us especially. I think a lot of the boys have been feeling down and you know to see some smiling faces and a bit of cheering is good. It wasn't all hostility for the Eagles at Waverley yesterday. After the siren, big bad Dermot Brereton had some surprisingly friendly words for teenager Ashley McIntosh. Telling me that I've um, you know got a lot of football in front of me and then I should just keep plugging away and um, give him my best and I'll do all right. You know it gave, gave me a bit of a thrill you know sort of him coming out to me like that. So. Dermy was still full of good humour at Glenferry Oval this morning as 5,000 Hawks fans joined in the grand final celebrations. There had been little or no sleep for the jubilant premiers, but no one was complaining. Yeah! This was the party the Eagles so badly wanted to hold today and have already started planning for in 1992. And we won't rest until such time as we can show you the, uh, the AFL Premiership Cup, so I thank you for your support. The reason it hurt so much in 1991 to lose that grand final was the fact that we'd had such a great season and really stood ourselves as the best side up until losing the grand final. We won 19 out of 22 games, including 12 in a row, which is the Eagles' best ever winning streak. We finished on top of the ladder three games clear with a huge percentage of 162, which had us way out on top of the ladder. And still, come grand final day, the experience of that great Hawthorne side was too much for us, and we caved in. Works bold leads in this race. Whoa! 
Well, they were committed. Yeah, he's all right. Yeah, he's up. I think he's turned his ankle, which is no good at all. Or is it his knee? That's rotten luck. The lowest point for me individually was round two, 1996, versus Brisbane at the Wacker when I hurt my knee. I missed the whole season, and on top of a really intensive and extensive rehab program to get my knee right, I was lucky enough that the club allowed me to sit in on selection and also sit in the coach's box on match days and have a look at how the team was going to run and, and how it all functioned from there, which was a great opportunity for me. I learned a lot doing that. But there was a story going around that I was sitting up there compiling a hit list. Now, we know I wouldn't do that. What did happen one day, though, was against Geelong down at Cardinia Park. I did notice that Buddha Hocking gave little skinny Dean Kemp a pretty hard hit after Kemp had delivered the ball down the ground, and poor old Kempy was doubled over in pain for quite a while after that. And I was pretty savage not being able to have any influence from up in the coach's box, and I had to wait and cool my heels until half-time. The only way I thought that I could have any influence was to pass a message on to my teammate, Tony Evans. I went down and saw little Evo and just said, Evo, when you go back out after half time, go up and tell Buddha Hocking that I saw what he did to Kemp and I'm going to get him back one day. I'll be back playing next year and his name's on my list. I'm going to get him. Evo did the right thing, went out and passed a message on straight after half time for Buddha. And I think Buddha gave him one just for him passing on the message. So Evo wasn't too happy with that, but I had to cool my heels and wait probably for six months before I got my chance to try and take it up with Buddha again myself. Before I became an eagle, I was very much a Fremantle boy growing up in this everyday street in Beaconsfield, but I certainly enjoyed learning and kicking the football around a lot with my dad and my brother Peter in the street. And uh, at primary school, we had a lot of support with our sport and uh, none more so from Mr Jones. Always gave me plenty of uh, encouragement in all of our sporting activities. Well, all I did uh, as far as his football was concerned was to encourage him and to um, occasionally umpire or bring... I actually brought in uh, a, a South Nevada player to do some umpiring, um, Barry uh, Cooper. And he said, Strike, uh, who's that kid? He's the best thing since sliced bread. And uh, that, that was the way John played even then. He would go in where angels fear to tread. I made my debut for the West Coast Eagles in round four in 1987 versus Carlton at Prince's Park. Pretty hostile there, over 20,000 supporters there to cheer the Blues on against the Eagles, and the, the Blues didn't let them down. They gave us a thrashing by 87 points, but it was still certainly a game I remember. I started on the bench and cooled my heels, waiting for that opportunity to run on and take part in my first AFL game. And the things I remember from that were playing on Peter Motley, who was a great player at the time, Paul Meldrum, another very solid, strong player, and thinking out there, Gee, I'm out of my depth here, playing on these guys, bigger, stronger, knew all about their ability, and I found it very tough. The pace was unbelievably quick. And I just remember coming off after that game, after we'd been thrashed, thinking, gee, I've got a lot of work to do here to make it at this level. But that set it in stone, and I went away thinking, I know what I've got to do, and I just kept building on things from there. In slow motion, one Carlton player and Silvani beats the lot of them, then he's big number 10s get in the road. He kicked it out of his own hands, but got it through to Motley. Motley's handball to Dennis, about to be caught. Warsfeld's tackle. He got rid of it in time. Caught with the football. Play on, says the umpire. Johnston. Murphy back in there again. And the free kick now given away. And perhaps the whistle was in umpire Howlett's mouth well before that. The kick now towards half forward and the mark taken by Warsfeld. Up to within 30 metres, Bennett underneath it, McKenzie pressuring him well, it comes back to Holmes, but look at all those blue jumpers and McKenzie, what a sterling job at fullback he's done. A couple of weeks later I got the opportunity to start on the ground for the first time. We were playing North Melbourne at Subiaco Oval and North Melbourne had the famous Cracker Brothers lining up for them. I was given the job of playing on Phil Cracker and trying to stop his influence on the game, so it was a pretty big task and I was very nervous going into the game, but I went out there, had a bit more run in my legs in those days and did a job just chasing him around the ground. A couple of times I remember him getting away and getting the ball, but I just threw everything into it, chased him and actually ran him down, tackled him, caught him with the ball. But uh, we had a good win that day, and that one really stands out being the first game, four quarters that I played in the AFL. Wiley is running hot, goes after the ball, but he's confronted by Larkin. Larkin, a hand pass intended for Ackley. It's robbed by Renstead. Brilliant pass as he hits Lewis on the chest. David Ackley having a 
a terrible quarter as it uh, comes across the ground to Warsfold. Now, Warsfold will kick from 45 metres out directly in front, and if he kicks this, the difference will be 26 points. So, a spirited uh, reply by the Eagles this, and Warsfold, there's the drop punt. No doubt about that one. 26 points the difference, and uh, the pressure now right back on North Melbourne. Well, it got out as far as 30 points. We said at the time if they got the next goal as we watched the build-up here. Larkin's hand pass mishandled. And watch this pass. Renstead spears the ball into Lewis, but it got out to five goals. They pulled it back to seven points. It's now out again to 26 points. It's going to be a tough assignment, Pete. By round 21 that year, I was starting to feel a little bit more comfortable running out and taking on the opposition in the AFL. But in this game, we're playing at the MCG versus Melbourne, and the man that I had to play on that day was the great Robbie Flower. He was an idol of mine as I was growing up. I knew how good he was and what he could do in a game, so I really concentrated on playing him very, very tight, trying to keep him out of the game. I remember early in the first quarter, he went for a mark, and I went to spoil as hard as I could to make sure he wasn't going to grab it. Maybe I caught him a bit high, and, and uh, rather than whacking the football cleanly, I may have caught him around the ears as well. Well, Melbourne players ran from everywhere. They cornered me, they all grabbed me, threatening me, you touch this bloke and we're going to kill you. And I thought, talk about untouchable. I know he's Robbie Flower, but he obviously had a special meaning at the Melbourne Footy Club. That only fired me up more. I wanted to play him harder and test him out, see how much they did want to live up to their words. But it was a good game. Melbourne had the last laugh. They beat us and really put us out of the running for the finals in our first season in the AFL. Can he keep it in play? No, he didn't. We'll have a boundary throw it on the other side. And tempers. Excellent football as Bailey puts it high. Oh, lovely mark to Flower. We've got fingertips to it, couldn't hang on. Now a chance behind for the mercurial Robert Flower. Snaps towards goal. People often talk and ask me about white line fever and whether it affects me, but certainly I do become a different person out in the footy field. I play a lot harder than I do, obviously, the way I present myself off the field but uh, I'm always in control out in the field. I do play the, the game hard and, and very fair, but uh, like I say, I'm always in control and just enjoy playing a real tough brand of football. Wilson, who kicked five goals last week. Up towards Mike Brown, that's back in time. Finds Graham. Wilson and Hockey. No, I wouldn't pitch the beer of either of those guys. But Waits down, may have to try and sock it. He's hammered over the line. It's a hand pass. Pops one across to Warsfold, gets by Tregenza, he's outside the 50, goes long, hasn't got the carry, I think so. I think that's a half ball. Watch his hands were good. Wills, bad kick, smothered bravely by Warsfold. In typical style, goes towards Matera on the boundary line, out of play. The Eagles have lifted a knot, up towards half forward. The Eagle can go on to Worsfold, 40 metres out. The skipper set sail for home, and I think he's put through a... another one. This is Lamb from centre half back through the centre. With the leap, Worsfold goes up and takes a fine mark. Couldn't control the ball, Turley. Not the best of oh. passes, that would be in the head, would it not to Worsfold? half forward he goes oh courage Warsfold he's got plenty of that he's a great player John Warsfold sure takes the kick Starsevich is the target over the top Warsfold inspirational mark down he goes confronted by Francis bit of Matera vacant goal square goes long down towards forward spectacular leap Warsfold missed it ball hit One of the most memorable moments in my footy career was a passage of play that took place not even in a finals game, not in a home and away game, but in a pre-season game way back in 1989. And what had happened, we were playing Hawthorne in the Panasonic Cup. And it was a very close game all the way through. It came down to scores being tied with only a minute to go. The rule of the day was that if scores were still tied at full time, the next team to actually score won the game. Kick the wards half forward from Pike. Storming up the ground, Hutton, he's been swung onto the forward line. Brilliant pickup by Langford on the burst. He kicks through centre. 
Down comes Come Rance. On, Hope pokes it back towards half forward. Lewis left without the ball. Schwab's got it now for Hawthorne. A high kick up towards half forward. Day uh, Jason Dunstall in front again. Marks on the 50. And his last three shots for goal have all gone out of bounds. He thinks he's too far out to score. He passes looking for Mew, but it dropped short. Rance to McKenna. Eagles still trying to finish on. Lamb back to McKenna. He puts it out wide. Turley. Up to full forward. Keane climbs and marks. Right in front, 40 metres from goal. Well, you couldn't blame Gowers on that occasion. He put his body in front as he did earlier, and he got the reward. The Hawks took the ball away. He brought it to ground. But that occasion, he attempted to do the same, but Keane just too tall. The margin is two goals. He can make it one goal with this. And he's done that. To 13-4. Ayers out of the centre, towards half forward. Turley goes up, takes a timely mark. How much time's the question on everybody's lips? Ball comes back towards midfield and the mark is taken by Lamb. Lamb plays on, well shepherded. The shepherder there was Brennan. There's the time remaining, Laurie Keane. The hero in the last gasp. Couldn't you imagine this man playing in the waffle? He'd be unstoppable, wouldn't he, Dennis? On his day, he was. Playing at full forward for Subiaco. Yeah. Paul Scott was on the ball. Heavy days for Subiaco, but now there's a key for the Eagles. Can he tie the scores? It's coming back. It looks pretty good. It's all square. Just so, a remind, Drew. Can he do it again? He's kicked two in a minute, Laurie Keane. Eagles needing to get this ball out of the centre. They've done that through Langdon. But he's kicked up short. We can't have a tie, of course, in the Panasonic Cup game. No, they'll keep playing until uh, there is a winner, even if time runs out. And oh, umpire. He's playing it against Lewis. I believe he shepherded Ayers out, but there was a collision. So Ayers takes the kick. Inside 50. Punch away. Comes to Kennedy. Dunstall in front. Still a contest. Off the ground by Platten. Oh, but it doesn't score. It's out of bounds. Scores still level. Any score. You've got to say now, as we go to extra time, next score wins. At the old game, and the spare block. This is Schwab tracking it towards the boundary line. It's out of bounds and will be thrown in. But it got too dark, Don. That was the go, wasn't it? Next score wins. Let's go home. I've got to go home for tea. There's a I would have result. taken my bat home by now. So, what a thriller. Next score wins the game. Abbott heads it down. Morris at close quarters. This is a fantastic way to finish a great game of football. Ayers collides out there with Dia, scrambles a kick goalward. Morris tries to knock it on. It goes towards the boundary line. Lewis and Platten out of bounds. It will be thrown in. Let's hope the umpires don't become too technical now because the player's really intent on getting this ball and getting a score. Well, three out of the last four games in the Panasonic Cup have been thrillers like this. It's on Hawthorne's forward line, but McKenna comes out of defence, somehow threads the hand pass out to Sumich. High to the wing. Warsfold is there, first to recover and double after it. Hacks it off the ground. Oh, that's great play. The hand pass comes in from Waters. Warsfold kept going. Short pass on his own is Pios in front, 40 metres out. Anything will do. And that's the ball game. Play <laughs> the siren. Now, I would say, going by that reaction, the players didn't quite know the rule. No, I don't think so either. But wasn't it terrific the way the West Coast attacked the ball over in the last, uh, out on that outer wing in the last bit? That was when it was supposed to be won. They didn't attack it all night, but they did at the final part, and they got a score on the ball. Bad luck, Hawthorne. They tried exceptionally hard. What a finish. Unbelievable finish. The two goals by Laurie Keane, and all of a sudden we woke up, wait a minute, this is a contest. Well, we've had three great games like this, haven't we? North Melbourne nearly getting up and snatching. Footscray actually did. And now the West Coast have repeated the performance. Great for team morale, that sort of victory. The ball was locked down the other end, and suddenly they exploded out. One final thrust down the ground, and a long kick from Paul Pios, and he's the hero. Well, how often do you see it? You know, the ball down in the opposition forward. Hawthorne had the numbers around, but they just happened to get the break. The pack opened up and the other team take it down uncontested and score.
What a sensational win, and we were very happy with it. But what makes that one of my all-time favourite passages of play is the fact that the last five guys to touch the footy to, and get that score for the Eagles were members of the winning Till Cup side in 1985, known as the Magnificent Seven. Oh, that's great play. The hand pass comes in from Waters. Warsbold kept going. Short pass on his own as Pios in front, 40 metres out. Anything will do. And that's the ball game. Eagles captain Guy McKenna, very good mate of mine, and I played alongside Bluey on the half back line for the Eagles for 11 years. We had a great understanding together, we worked extremely well together. Well, most of the time, anyway, because there were times when we stuffed it up. It was a game against Melbourne at Waverley Park, and I was all on my own, called for the ball from Bluey, who all he had to do was chip it over to me. He messed it up, it's gone over my head, and on a wet day, as I turned to try and grab the footy, I slipped over in the goal square and Melbourne just came through and kicked an easy goal. I was certainly blaming Bluey for that poor disposal towards me, whereas Bluey thought it was the other way around and was ripping into me for falling over and not holding my feet. And there was another game against Collingwood in the finals in 1990. Very similar situation. Again, I was on my own, called for the ball from Bluey, who chipped it out to me in the back pocket, again over my head. As I turned to try and run onto the footy, Darren Mullane came through and cleaned me up, forced me over the boundary line out of play, and I was helpless then as Peter Dacos, who was my direct opponent, swooped on the ball and then from the boundary line, and I was stuck at this stage right behind him, I just watched him do one of those miraculous kicks that then just floated and dribbled and went straight through for a goal. I couldn't believe it. Catching, 65 metres out, mammoth kick into the square. Look at that, a mark taken by Guy McKenna. He's not wasting any time getting the ball moving. Great bump by Darren Malay. In comes Brown, Collingwood lifting. Brown right on the boundary line. Back to Mullane, likewise. Dacos nearly runs out of room. Oh. He's goal! Magnificent goal! I remember back in 1988, one game at Moorabbin, when big plugger Lockett was still playing for the Saints. And Bluey McKenna was playing a loose man across the half-back line, falling back into the hole to cover up Plugger's leads. But Bluey was doing it so well, I reckon he'd taken six marks in that first quarter. And nearly every time he took a mark on his own there, he'd feed the ball out to me running off. And we were working very well, so I was getting plenty of the football as well. Obviously, Plugger wasn't too happy with Bluey falling into his space. So late in the first quarter, as Plugger came out, scooped up the footy, Bluey laid a pretty good tackle on him, except Plugger just realised that there was this bit of a dead weight hanging off his jumper. As he swung his arm around to knock it away, he actually caught Bluey across the head and knocked him out cold. Now, I was the first man on the scene to try and have a go at Plugger. He was trying to rip my head off, but luckily I'd had a really short haircut that week and he couldn't quite get a grip on it. And people said, you're biting off more than you can chew there, we should take it on Plugger. But I wasn't really unhappy with Plugger, bar the fact that he knocked out Bluey, who was feeding me the football all day, and I thought I'm going to have to work for my kicks from here on in. I was always getting into trouble, sticking up for Bluey McKenna. Another time here at Subiaco Oval versus Richmond, Bluey got a tackle, nearly got his head ripped off, and the umpires paid holding the ball. Well, we couldn't believe it. But as the umpires pinged Bluey for the holding the ball, Dale Waitman's run in and dropped his elbow right on Bluey's head. Now that made me angry as well. So I ran in, I grabbed the flea off Bluey, had him by the neck, and I was trying to hold the flea away from me. And at the same time, I was arguing with the umpire. So I had Dale Waitman on one side, arguing with the umpire on the other. In the last minute, McKenna taken high. Oh. Holding the ball, says the umpire. It's a Richmond free kick, well, I've never seen the like of that. Well, it was an interesting piece of play. Initially, it was a great spoil from Warsfold. He went up with two fists and punched the ball in the direction of McKenna, which takes the act of spoiling to a new level. First milestone game was my 50th game, and that was against Geelong at the Wacker. The next one, my 100th game, was against Brisbane, up in Brisbane. And what made that one special was the fact that my brother Peter was playing for the Brisbane Bears at the time. It was my 100th game, Mum and Dad flew over to Brisbane for it. Peter was playing, first time and only time I've ever played football against him at any level. And it was a drawn game, could you believe it? The last kick of the game by a Bears player went through and made it a draw. Dad went down into the rooms, both rooms after the game, and he came over into the Eagles rooms and couldn't believe how distraught we were coming away with a draw from that game. We should have won it. He'd also been in the Brisbane rooms and said it was like a huge celebration over there. They were wrapped 
They'd never ever beaten the Eagles. It was the first, obviously the closest they'd got. A drawn game and they were wrapped with that. Back come the Eagles. Main wearing from half back towards centre. We can look out. Almost a collision between two Eagles. Langdon's got it. Centering kick. Brennan will have to go here with a flight of the ball and he does. Can go over the top. He heard the voice. Warsbold now. 40 metres from goal. John Warsbold in his 100th. He's pushed off it well. Out of bounds on the ball in the left ball forward pocket. And the Bears will bring it out. What a finish. And what a game it's been. A point the margin. Precious seconds ticking away. The ball on the outer wing with McClucky. Under two and a half minutes remaining. McClucky goes for distance and he tumbles it. It bounces over the top at half four. Could have been holding on there to Waterman. Sandy in this uh, final term. but just haven't had players down there to finish it off for the Brisbane Bears. Waterman's kick back towards centre wing. Here's a chance for Gaston. If he can strike the tackle. He does. Gives it to Noonan, who's had a good game against Lewis. But oh. there's a fine smother. Matera sets it up for Lewis. He could cover himself in glory, but he can't pick it up. So he taps it on cleverly to Worsfold. Oh. His hand pass was met for Lewis. Instead, it found Gaston. It could open the door for Noonan. He kicks it up towards half forward. Merritt wants a mark, but he can't take it. A tired David Bain runs towards the football. Gets it to White. Now he can kick any goal. He's 55 out. He set sail for home. And he's kicked the behind and scores our left. Oh, what a, what a finish. Well, uh, it's, this is easily the best game we've seen on the Gold Coast. Oh, this, my, word. my word. It's been an amazing performance by the Bears. A minute 20 left. It's in the Bears' attacking zone, but Waterman has it. Scores are level. Kemp on the other side. Two bounces. These players are tired, but Kemp keeps going. Three bounces. A chip up towards Langdon. Any score will do at this stage. To half forward. Sumich. Taking time to get back into it. Kemp can cover himself in glory for the Eagles now. He shoots it towards goal and he's put it through. That could be the sealer for the West Coast Eagles. Kemp has kicked his first goal. And again, the West Coast sneak away with under 40 seconds remaining. It's only 39 on the clock now, and the West Coast, I feel, have got this wrapped up. Very important centre bounce coming up. Darrell Wright has rucked tirelessly all night. He's really lift himself in this last instance. And uh, vital that the Bears, if they are to uh, tie up this match, Darrell Wright must get this knockout and win the ball from the centre square. Oh. Inside the last 40 seconds then. Laidley. Here's a chance for the Bears. They can take it down and tie it. Around the other side, it's Clark. Finds Bain. He's 70 metres from goal. He pulls it back. We're down to 23 seconds. Merritt couldn't hang on. Worsfold lays it off. Hurry, kick McClucky. It goes straight up in the air. They can test 15 metres out. No contest. Windsor has taken this mark. And this could be it for the tie. Oh, amazing. <laughs> I hope he doesn't know how close it is to siren time. He may find out this to tie the game if he gets a goal. There's the siren. Now he knows the kick after the siren to tie for the young man. Ray wins has done it. It's a goal. Oh. <laughs> so it's a tie at Carrara. Oh, what a finish. What a finish. Two goals to Windsor. Scores are level and probably Bernie a fitting finish the way these two sides have fought this out tonight here are the final scores Brisbane 14 8 92 Brisbane 14 8 92 have drawn with the Eagles 13 14 92 and uh, the crowd here streaming out onto the ground Roger Merritt well, young Jakovic did a pretty good job on yes. him tonight. Seeing that vision of Brisbane reminds me that when Peter came home from Brisbane, he was a few dollars short in his pocket. He'd lent a couple of hundred dollars to Adrian Fletcher while he was over there, thinking that he'd get the money back before he came back to Perth. Well, that didn't happen. Peter moved back to Perth and had made contact with Fletch a few times to see if he'd send over the cheque. Now, Fletch obviously got a, a fairly average memory, forgot to put the cheque in the mail. Now, the next time the Eagles played Brisbane at Subiaco Oval, I knew that this had gone on and I knew that Fletch was still earning a good quid 
playing AFL footy, while Peter was struggling a little bit playing West Star Rules, obviously not earning anywhere near as much. And I didn't think it was quite right that Fletch still owed him a couple of hundred bucks. So as the ball was bounced to start the game against Brisbane here at Subiaco Oval, I made sure I made a beeline for Fletch and the first chance I got in a pack, tackled him, got him underneath the pack and let him know all about it. Fletch, you tight mongrel, you owe my brother a couple hundred bucks. You know, he's living off the bones of his bum and you won't even pay him. Really gave it to Fletch and chased him up for the whole first quarter, gave him a fearful time and let him know that every time he got near the ball, I was going to be looking, looking out to get him. Yeah, yeah, I remember it well. Um, I lived with Peter Worsfold, his brother, up in Queensland, and uh, we lived in a unit together, and I, I owed him some money on the, on the bill, and he'd left to come back to West Australia. And it'd been a year, and I, I actually forgot about it. And when I uh, run onto the ground, the, we uh, played West Coast, uh, it was around five or six or something, I can't remember, but the ball was bumbling out towards uh, the half-back line, or our half-forward line. And this steam train come out and nearly killed me. I thought, who the hell is this? And it was Wusher, and uh, he grabbed me by the throat and threatened me and said he's going to kill me if I don't pay his brother the money. And I thought, Jesus. So I sent for the runner, and uh, I was paying the check out, I reckon, at quarter time, because this bloke was dead says serious, he's going to kill me. The veins were popping out of his head. So I suppose the moral to the story is uh, don't owe money to the worst folks. <laughs> My 150th game was a pretty big day, and it was against Essendon our big arch rivals here at Subiaco Oval. And I remember the day clearly because 150 games meant I was then eligible for life membership at the West Coast Eagles. So it was a pretty big achievement and it was a very emotional day. And the players really put up a good fight. And we had a close fought win against the Bombers. And normally after each game, I'm the, the last player to lead the players off the ground. I wait for them all and pat them on the back as we leave the ground. But that day I was pretty emotional so I was actually the first one to run off the ground and, and got into the comfort of the change rooms where I could get away from the spotlight. But it was a big win and a very special day. For some reason I was a lot more relaxed about my 200th game which was against Geelong down at Cardinia Park. Pretty hostile territory and it was a very windy day down there and it was an important game for the Eagles to win. I was more relaxed I think because of the build up to my 150th game and that meaning life membership at West Coast Eagles, there was a lot more emotion involved. My 200th game and being an important game for the Eagles, I was just more focused on winning it. I draw my inspiration from every one of you. An entire grandstand had to be evacuated before the game because gale force winds had left iron sheeting hanging precariously. The Eagles made up the numbers with 27 running out initially. When Malthouse had to show his hand, it was clear Warsfold's 200th was going to be a day for the old stages. McKenna in, Lewis in. It looked like being first goal wins with neither side scoring a major in the first quarter. The strong cross wins played havoc with shots for goal. The Eagles applied some scoreboard pressure in the second term with a five goal burst to lead by 19 points at half time. Burns got it back to 12 points in the opening minutes of the third term. The Eagles withstood 17 minutes of all-out cat attack before Morrison struck a psychological blow. Burns tried to ignite his team with another flash of boundary line brilliance, but it was the rock-solid Stoneham that gave his side some hope. That was the Cats' last goal for the match, though, as the Eagles' defence, led by Captain Courageous, locked the game up. Houston made sure of the result with two 50-metre bombs, one just before and another after the siren. The nature of the 21-point victory was a fitting tribute to Warsfold, but more importantly, it puts the Eagles back on track. It was a great win and it did mean a lot to me, winning in my 200th game. And my teammates showed so much emotion and we stuck together, they cheered me off. It was a real touching moment until Jacko looked up and told me that the only reason he wanted to carry me off was so he could get his photo in the paper. Hey, watch out! The only reason I'm looking at some of this photo. <laughs>
Charles. Well, I said, all my inspiration's been you blokes and you were again today. That's all I expect. And now uh, we start, we start to drive our advantage home from now, boys. Come on! Hey. He was one of the early Eagles and uh, the inaugural Eagles and he was only a youngster at that stage but uh, even then he was a solid performer. He was an outstanding performer but he was a solid performer and uh, you could tell by you know, his, the way that he played football and also when you do your research what he's like off the ground too. He was studying pharmacy and uh, you know you combine a lot of things and the way he presented himself when you know, you did pre-match interviews, you thought, well, this boy is just a little bit different from the rest. The captain is the leader of the side, and uh, you set the example on the, on the field, and he did that on numerous occasions. In the early days, I often played on players that were a little bit taller, by sometimes two inches, or, you know, sometimes up to 10 kilos heavier than me. Players like Dennis Banks and Darren Mullane from Collingwood and uh, always found it pretty tough to match up on them, but uh, the toughest and strongest was Gary Ablett, who um, was always a hero watching him play and doing the unbelievable feats he could do. And I remember always going out and if I was actually lining up to play on him, just hoping that that wouldn't be the day he was going to show some of his Superman feats. Can the Cats get one before the break? Mitch, who started on the bench, up to who takes the mark. Mitchell White sitting underneath it and takes a courageous mark and coming hard over the top again was Gary Abler. I've been known as the Eagles enforcer, the hitman. I've even been called the smiling assassin. I'm not that happy that after 12 years, taking a few marks, kicking a few goals, all I'm remembered for is running three guys. But anyway, here's some of my favourite hits. Oh, look, I, I remember, I think we played a night game at Waverley uh, one year and uh, John was going back from Mark and I was running towards him. I said, well, this is my chance and uh, I gave it a full tilt and uh, barreled him. But uh, to John's credit, he got up straight away and uh, didn't, didn't appear to be anything wrong with him. So he certainly uh, could give him and, and take him as well. Connell kicks out to... Oh! Warsfold, Willem and Wareham, he's pretty tough. Harvey collected him. The shirt front on Graham Wright at Victoria Park in front of a hostile crowd, which became even more hostile after that, was a pretty special bump because earlier in the game, Shane Watson had run through Josh Wooden and that really lifted the Collingwood boys. When I managed to retaliate and give that good bump on Graham Wright, our guys really lifted and, and walked a bit taller in that game and we got on top and ended up winning the game at Victoria Park, which is always a tough thing to do. For Graham Wright, as a result of that collision with John Warsfold, he has been taken from the ground on a stretcher. Yeah, I uh, obviously played on him quite a few times, me being an ex-forward and him being an ex-backman. I remember um, always having some tough times with him. You know, he was he was heart of the ball and I was heart of the ball too, so I always enjoyed playing on him. I suppose one time I didn't enjoy playing was in, on him was in a state game uh, with, uh, with Clash and I ended up uh, the old uh, depressed fracture of the cheekbone, so that wasn't good fun. But uh, no, I, I always, uh, in a strange way, I suppose you respected him, but uh, at the other end of the scale, you never wanted to be on the end of too many of his bumps because he used to hit pretty hard. This time, he finds Osman. He makes you earn them, John Moore's fault. One of my last big hits was on Glen Archer here at Subiaco Oval where I came leading out from the forward line trying to take a chest mark, came at flat out pace, Archer was in the way and I just hit him full tilt as I was trying to take the chest mark. Certainly knocked the wind out of him but Archer being such a tough competitor got up and played on. McKenna in the road, Stone, back to McKenna, needs to be neat with the ball, beats two of them, back to Stone, over the head of Scott, Wooten again. Oh, courage by Archer and gets taken out 
nothing for it from the umpire, Stevens. Well, not, not, uh, not a skerrick. Archer still on the ground. He's tough. Let's look at it again. Well, one man for the footy. Cool. Well, they're both tough. The bump on Modra was a pretty good one because I had to run back with the flight of the ball, try to keep my eyes on it, and I knew McIntosh and Modra were somewhere in the vicinity and coming out. But all I was aiming to do was get a clean fist on the ball, which I managed to do, and punch it through for a behind. Back into the was Johnny Weisbold. Yeah, yeah, I remember it quite well, actually. It was good. It woke me up a little bit, yeah. What, what were your recollections of it? Oh, not too much. I knew I was on the ground in pain for a while, but no. Nah. I guess it's, it's good that he's not playing on the weekend. The Western Derbies, especially the first couple, were just always going to be really hard and flat out as the Eagles especially try to intimidate the young Dockers players. And I thought I'd try and lead the way. Derbies are special games no matter what people say. And the Eagles players certainly got more pumped up than for pretty much any other game. So in the first couple, I really wanted to stamp my authority and came out and ran as hard as I could every time I could. Greg Madigan in his 43rd game is going to put the Dockers into their attacking zone, maybe for the first time. But they zigzag across the ground. Bang! In comes Johnny Worsfold. That's the Worsfold we know, charging at the football. The bump on Grinter I was very happy with. I was only a very young Eagles player, about 19 at the time, and Grinter was the tough man of the competition. When I managed to give him a shirt front and he had to get carted off for the rest of that quarter, my senior teammates were just so pleased with me, it really made me walk tall. Wilson, who kicked five goals last week, and a real shirt front as Worsfold cannons it to his opponent. What to half forward, Glenn Dinning. Grindle looks as though he's coming off. In fact, they're right in the middle of the play there. Gary Lyon goes through them all. One of the bumps that is probably the one that most people want to talk about is the one on Dermot Brereton. At Subiac Oval, right here, a long time ago, but it was one of the real sweet bumps. Dermot had nowhere to go. If he wanted to score a goal, which I knew was going to be the case, he had to turn back into play and try and snap a ball from the point line. And I just saw my opportunity, ran in hard and cleaned him up with a nice solid bump, knocked him over the line, but actually the ball stayed in play. I stopped at the time, thought it was out of play, but Maney came in, picked up the ball and ran off with it. So it was one of the best bumps, not because it was on Dermot, but because it caused a turnover for the team and we ran off with the ball. Waits down, may have to try and sock it. He's hammered over the line. One of the hardest hits that I was involved in was a state of origin game at the MCG, WA versus Victoria. I came off the half back line running as hard as I could towards the ball, with Gary Ablett coming as hard as he could the other way, and we hit each other at full steam ahead. It was one of the hardest collisions that I'd been involved with. We both hit the deck and both bounced up and got on with the game. But it was a pretty special moment. Grabs his Hawthorne teammate as the opposition tonight. But look at this man. Whoa! Oh, boom! Crash opera! It's funny who you bump into when you're retired from footy. I'm pretty happy in the commentary box for the moment. And just the other week, I bumped into Mickey McGuan, who I gave a fearful spray to after a final at the Wacker back in 1994. Luckily, Mickey doesn't hold a grudge. Inside the 50, missed by McGuan. It comes to Djakovic. They dive in, it's all over. The siren will sound. McGuan had the half chance, couldn't hang on. It's all over at the Wacker. And what a remarkable game of football. Only fitting in the weekend we've had. Collingwood. Ever so close. It doesn't need this to finish. It does not need this to finish. The Eagles need to be gracious victors here because Collingwood was a third. That's one of the best games of football I've seen by uh, both sides. Collingwood were terrific, Dennis. Oh. And the Eagles, when they when Collingwood threw everything at them, and I think Warsfold, I hope he's not talking about that missed opportunity right at the end to Mickey McGuire. It was a tough one. What a game of football. I played at a Mick Malthouse for nine years and I was his captain for eight of those years. And my main aim as captain of the club was to be an extension of Mick on the field. I knew what his coaching philosophies were. I knew what he wanted to achieve in our game plan. 
and I made sure that I carried that out on the field with the players. I really had the communication between Mick and the players was through me on the field and I worked so hard at that over all those years and we had a lot of success doing it, getting Mick's game plan working the way he wanted. We had the results with two premierships in 1992 and 1994. Towards the end of my career there was a lot of question marks about the way I was treated to finish off not playing in that last game against the Bulldogs at the MCG. Now it did hurt, I wanted to play in that game, I tried to get myself as fit as I could be, trained as hard as I could to show that I was ready to play. But in Mick and the match committee's eyes, they didn't think I was up to four quarters of footy. We had a difference of opinion. I thought I was okay to go and could have got through the game, but I couldn't guarantee them the four quarters. And I understand that coaches going into finals footy want to know that they've got a side that can run out the whole game. It was a tough decision, I'm sure, for Mick to make, and it was tough on me but you have to wear the coach's decision, you have to stick by it. And I'd done that for my whole footy career and I wasn't going to change for the sake of the last game. And it was also tough not knowing if it was going to be my last game or not. I didn't end up playing and that meant that the week before against Adelaide was the last game I played in. And I had a fair idea that that was going to be the last game I ever played at Subiaco anyway. And that was pretty tough for me because I was really the only one who knew that. The crowd, my teammates, my family didn't really understand that that could have been my last game at Subiaco Oval live in front of them. So that was very emotional for me and I found it pretty tough to deal with. And then I was just praying to be out there against the Western Bulldogs. I didn't end up playing and it's, there's been a lot of public and media comment about it. And I understand where the match committee was coming from but it doesn't take away from the hurt that I felt by not running out there with the players. And when that final siren went, as much as I had that individual disappointment, I still felt for the team and for the West Coast Eagles as a club because we had been humiliated. It was our worst ever performance in a finals game and that was probably what hurt me most. So walking off the MCG after the game, I did take a moment to reflect on the good times that I'd had there, the Premiership wins, a lot of the other great wins against some great sides at the MCG. And while there was still a big crowd at the ground, and sure they were celebrating the Bulldogs win, but I just soaked up the atmosphere knowing that it was the last time I would feel it really as someone who'd taken part in a game. Even though I didn't play, I really felt as though I was part of the loss and felt the disappointment and it was a pretty sad time. Grew a lot in his late teens uh, from a medium-sized player into a very tall. Minton Connell gave it to Martin, but Stone has battled manfully, takes the mark on his chest. Dying seconds of the season for the West Coast Eagles. Comes to Waterman. Chips it up towards the wing. They'll finish with the ball, but not much comfort. Exciting victory by the Western Bulldogs. I think most people expected it coming in. Great return for that man, Simon Mitten Connell with five goals. And the dream that was snuffed out in the preliminary final last season. Well and truly alive. Rejection in the box there. It's been a funny season for the Eagles. A number of half chances along the way, but none of them taken. The Western Bulldogs definitely a legitimate premiership contender. Well, Muddy, I guess uh, the only way to describe it, one of, the, one of those days at the office. Yeah, it was pretty average in the end. Uh, make all excuses in the world for who wasn't out here in our side, but we just didn't play well. They were great. The Bulldogs are a great running side, aren't they? They just never give up. They're just 100 miles an hour. I think one played with a lot of passion, you know? How would you describe the year for the Eagles for all the people back home, mate? Well, there's a lot of what-ifs this year. So many close games, but no matter how close you lose a game, boy, you don't get the ball, you don't get the points for it. We've just got to win them all. We had a lot of close games. If we'd have won two or three more, we could have been the top four. Maybe a different story, but, you know, you're asking a fair bit when you want to come from seven. Good on you, mate. All the best. And, uh... Distance between Michael Malthouse and this man John Warsfold. Just looking down at John Warsfold as he came off the ground, a feeling perhaps he was savouring the moment for the final time. I know that's a big thing to say, but left out of the team today, and it was a measured walk off the MCG by the West Coast Eagles skipper, a man who's known success on this ground. A couple of premierships twice alongside Michael Malthouse, who's lift up a trophy high. In the months after my retirement, the question people most asked me was, did you feel you were harshly dealt with by the Eagles at the end of your career? Now maybe in the last game, when I didn't play against the Bulldogs, things could have been done a little bit better. 
that's a judgment call for people to make up their own decision. I've always warned the coach's decision and I've always stuck by it. I've seen him make some tough decisions involving good friends of mine, good teammates, and I've always had to stick by the coach and I did that on this occasion. As much as it hurt and I wanted to play in that last game, I understood the reasons why I wasn't going to. The Eagles gave me a lap of honour in 1999, which was a very special moment for me, and it signified the great times that I'd had at the club. I still feel very comfortable walking into the doors of the West Coast Eagles, and I will forever and a day. And I've still got two premierships to hang my hat on.